All right, we are recording. Unconditional love to everybody watching this video. I'm Tyler Ellison, and I am here with the amazing Lauren Johnson, senior level universal healing Dow instructor and dear friend of mine. Lauren, thank you for being here today with me, sir. Thank you, Tyler. It's a blessing to be here with you and share with all that are listening. Thank you for your presence as well. Awesome. So I want to just talk a little bit about my relationship with you so people who are listening in have some context for how you and I both know each other. So I met Lauren probably in 20, I want to say 2017, I think me and you met. And originally I was going through the Montauk Chia Universal Healing Tao books on healing love, uh, which is all about the tantric arts used to cultivate spiritual energy with a partner in intimate exchanges. And it was really beautiful. And I started uh, consulting LJ because I found him on YouTube and it was his channel to wellness yoga. This is, I think one of your older channels and it had just everything. Like it had everything I was reading in these books where I felt I only had so much context. LJ's videos on YouTube had like everything there just demonstrated, explained. And it was such a wealth of information where I eventually was like, I must speak to this guy because clearly he knows what he's doing. And clearly I can only go so far with, with books, right? So I started getting sessions with LJ and the beautiful thing about the universal healing Tao system is it starts essentially with the earth level, working with earth consciousness, earth energies at the very beginning, it's working with that within your own body and then expanding out to the greater earth, pulling that in. And then eventually you just start leveling up in your consciousness and you can start to play with the forces at bigger levels. And at a certain point, I just started playing around with the stuff LJ gave me and it just became this natural stairway to heaven where I was like, I must keep going because it just, it became this path that felt so natural and organic to me. And I've been working with him to this day and LJ, I'm honored to continue working with you. I'm thankful that you're one of my, my many teachers and you are such a shining star and great, great example for, I think a lot of people of what good virtue, what practice, what following your heart can crystallize. Like I see you as someone who's just diving into this world, living into this world nonstop. And it's so beautiful to observe you as the manifestation of these practices within yourself. Thank you for that very considerate uh, and generous observation. And it's all about service for me. So however I might serve, that's why I produced all those videos. And so power moves to those who are committed to serve. And that's my, my ultimate focus is just serving. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. So what, in terms of spiritual practice, um, Taoist stuff, yogic stuff, or any type of modality we haven't mentioned so far, what was your doorway? Did you have a specific intro into these worlds where they sort of revealed themselves through synchronicity or what have you? Well, I was my first job when I moved to LA a couple weeks after graduating high school because I wanted to perform and I did. I did the Hollywood life for a while. Um, I was a fitness instructor. I was really into sports and martial arts growing up. And so I was teaching fitness. And then I met a, um, a yoga teacher who showed me one move. She was like, just try this move. And I did one move and I just, I was in a, in a, in a unique space at that moment. Um, kind of like the channels were open. You could say it was a full moon and I was at a kind of a, an event. It was an art, um, op an art opening basically. And it was just real conscious environment, a lot of conscious people. And it was just like this air of, of like a, a awakening, like something's going to happen. And this lady just sat me down and she just showed me one yoga move and and I was starting to feel it. And she goes, close your eyes. And when I closed my eyes, I saw all my cells and all my atoms, like just the vastness of all the stars in the galaxy. I just felt this, this deep sense of this, this infiniteness of my nature. And so um, I was like, what? And I was just one yoga pose. So then I just started doing yoga every day, twice a day. And I've never missed a day. I basically recognized yoga in its various branches, it's all the Tao yoga, Tai Chi, Qigong, like many, many, many things come under the heading of yoga, the meditative paths. Um, I just recognized it to be the pinnacle of fitness. So I just, I just devoted myself first to a daily practice and it just kind of snowballed into um, what, I, what I've learned and what I now teach. 
Nice. Oh, that's that's awesome. And when you started going into it, was it for how you how you sort of addressed it as the pinnacle of fitness? Did it start for you as this like physical thing, or did it become from a physical thing into more of a like a spiritual exploration? Like, did that sort of awakening experience lead you towards higher realizations? Um, I guess what I'm asking in, in so many words is did this lead to you sort of finding yourself or waking up to the energy oh, that you are? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's my, I owe so much of my, my self awakening and the level of health physically, emotionally, spiritually that I'm able to cultivate within myself and share with others. So much of that I attribute to just having a practice, just having a, a refuge of practice where you, okay, this is my time to like return to center Return to, to source alignment. Um, it all, yeah, it came out of a practice, but it did also follow the trajectory you just articulated. In the beginning, it was kind of more physical for me. Like I was amazed at these incredible physical states I could get into, bending myself in all these positions and how much energy I had. Um, and then it slowly got more into the meditative arts, where I was like, okay, now I'm in this like peak hormonal state from all this yoga. Wow, if I just close my eyes bring one point of attention to the sound of my breath. It's amazing how tranquil emotionally I feel. I mean, emotions are the number one cause of, of disease, so to speak, uh, based on the Tao and Chinese medicine that came from it. And so, I mean, if we can deal skillfully with our emotions, we're, we're a successful human. I mean, I've, I've seen some of the biggest absolutely bona fide masters just fall off the deep end with negative emotions. I mean, it's like a never ending, like, just dealing with that. So yeah, it started off kind of physical, but then moved more into the subtle space of, of, uh, of the meditative practices. That's awesome, man. That's so, that's so exciting to hear. And, <laughs> and we're taking off. West Coppers, man. West Coppers. Uh, it's, uh, it's true. I live in, I live in the city too. So it's, it's um, understandable with uh, the amount of people and, and cars and stuff. Uh, I, one of the things I wanted to ask too is I know for, for myself when I was young, I felt like my future self, my higher self, my soul, whatever you want to call it, was leaving me breadcrumbs throughout my childhood to kind of get my younger mind to like, at a certain point, put all the pieces together and maybe wake up to a greater responsibility or a greater path. And for me, it was like being really into things like Harry Potter, being really into superhero movies, being really into like Legos and building and observing things from this bird's eye point of view. Uh, being really into martial arts, too. That was a big thing when I was a kid in both um, practice and also in entertainment. And there were so many levels of this. I would be drawn to superheroes where their skills were psychic, right? There was a show called Teen Titans, and one character, her name was Raven. And I was, like, obsessed with this character. I was like, I want to do what she's doing. This is amazing. Did you have, when you were, before you maybe got onto this path, do you feel you had breadcrumbs that your future self was giving you? that were sort of geared to lead you from point A to point B to point C to the, the moments of realization. Absolutely. And that's a very skillful way to put that, that I'm going to probably adopt um, because I have always gravitated to listening to people, especially when it counts, like just like, hey, I feel like you have something going on anything you want to talk about and then so much healing comes out of just listening and i don't mean thinking about what you're going to say or oh i had this experience like that no i mean true listening because one of those famous sayings in the Tao: she flows where the mind goes um by, by giving somebody your attention it's it's just so healing because because you're giving them energy that's that energy they need to like process that it's one of the greatest needs we have is to be heard and so i just noticed growing up that I was always, I didn't get off on it, but I was interested in the suffering of others. I was like, okay, what's going on with you? That's interesting, you know? So I feel like um, now in becoming so devoted to the healing arts, that, that that thread was always there. Of Like people just like to tell me and confide in me and like tell me their stuff, you know? And, um, and breadcrumbs, that's a really great way to put it. I did some training with Tony Robbins. I did Unleash the Power Within uh, workshop, which I recommend to every human. I'm not a Robinite or anything like that, but he just, he, he, he had put so much in that workshop that most people don't know of just how to live a meaningful life and, um, 
there's a lot of sound bites I could get into about why I like that training. But one of the things that we did was um, this notion of it's never too late to have a happy childhood. So, you know, when you go back and you think about sufferings that happen um, as a child, or frankly, any time, but especially as children, um, we were raised by humans. They were, they were human. They had their own problems. They were tired. They had their own issues. And usually this, like, one moment or this period of time that will, like, will define us, like, why I have this suffering. When you go back and look at what was going on, the parents were usually tired. They were pressure and so forth. So I'm able to be, to my child self, that support that for whatever reason my parents, and I am grateful to be, to, now that I get out in the world and I see what real suffering is, my parents were saints. But there's always, you know, levels of that. You know, it's like I still had suffering. I mean, it's one of the found, you know, hallmarks of the human experience. So I go back to my suffering self, and I'm, and I'm able to, like, be that supportive presence that just couldn't listen to you at that moment or whatever. And, and, it, and it helps because in the infinite nature of nature, it's all right now. And most people just hold on to that. Well, I didn't listen. You know, you didn't listen to me then. And now I'm just wounded. I, I don't want to be dysfunctional. I want to relax, let it go. And then out of that willingness to relax and, like, go fill up with fresh energy and evolve. So, um, so I consciously now will go back to, to periods of my life where there was suffering, and I'll, and I'll reprogram it. I'll dial in with that being, and hey, it'll be okay. Hey, grieve through your feet, that kind of stuff. So that's a really great way to, way to put it, leaving breadcrumbs for your, for, your, for your future self. Wow, well said, too. And, and that's such a powerful practice. I mean, when I, I remember when, when people first recommended those meditations to me before I was very open. I remember being like, oh, I'm just kind of imagining my younger self. But then when you zoom out into the more quantum understanding it really is like us tuning into a frequency of the younger self that is a literal being just like we're a unique frequency made up of our thoughts body feeling spirit now we tune into the younger self we're dialing into that frequency that still exists in its own reality and i i look at it as like editing you're essentially editing your past that's a good way to say it yeah <laughs> for yeah. sure because we can't change, that kind of brings me back for a moment. And I just have to mention it since I kind of plugged in and it's like, it's probably the biggest thing I got out of that Unleash the Power Within. Um, this thing, the state triad, as I call it, um, change your physiology, change your state, change your focus, change your state, change your meaning, change your state. Or another way to say that is the three decisions that shape life. What are you going to focus on? What does it mean? What are you going to do? Okay. So. Yeah. Just with the change your physiology, change your focus, change your meaning, change your state. Well, I get it. If I'm cold, put on a jacket. If I'm hungry, eat. Let's change your physiology, change your state. Change your focus, change your state. Whatever you focus on gets your energy. Therefore, if I want to bring my energy away from stress and suffering, I'm going to put it on something else. I don't practice helping somebody, whatever, that yields better results. So that we get that too. But to change your meaning, which we arrive at through language, the stories we tell ourselves and others, change your state. Is probably the biggest thing I got out of that because 10 people could have the same experience. The example that he gave in the, in the seminar was two guys watched their best friend die in Vietnam. And one of them, like in their hand, bleeding to death, okay, now he's dead. One guy died from a broken heart. This is the worst day of my life. The other guy was like, yeah, this really hurts, but I'm going to teach others the things that I employed to not die from a broken, a broken heart. So he adjusted his meaning. Okay, that's basically the only thing we have control over is our attitude and our meaning, especially what's happening in the world today. We can't, like Master Chia said, the first time I trained with him, we can't control what happens outside of ourselves, only our relationship to it, our response to it, the meaning we give it. So yeah. most people, like when I experience suffering, I'm like, well, is this being done to me, victim, therefore I'm giving my power away, or did I choose this to evolve my soul? The meaning we give things is our choice. So that's why I'm going back to that child. We can't change what happened. We can change the meaning we give it. And I'm like, all right, what doesn't kill you make you stronger. It's the same reason I tap myself every day. So when I look back on whatever shortcomings I even perceive in my childhood, my parents were just making me stronger. That bully was just making me stronger, you know, whatever. Yeah. There was this, I actually, just, I was drawing this, uh, it's a card deck I have, and it's called the Keys of the Octurians, and it's channeled sacred geometry cards from that star system. And the card I drew today was forgiveness. And this card blew my mind because it was literally like forgiveness. Let me, I, I want to go get it, but I want to get off camera. So I'll stay on camera and just sort of reminisce it. But pretty much 
it was saying forgiveness is coming to the understanding that you can't do any wrong because you're constantly doing the best that you know how to do with the current understandings, aka meanings, definitions that you have. And the point of forgiveness in recognizing you can't do any wrong is to essentially let go of the need to forgive because wrong doesn't truly exist. Now, forgiveness as a tool, I think, is very useful, right? Because sometimes we, it's, I know it's useful for me to be like, okay, I know this person hasn't objectively done a wrong because that's a human construct of right and wrong. They're just life, God expressing itself. But I still might feel bitter or resentful or hateful towards what has happened. So I think for humans, forgiveness is a good thing, right? Because it helps us to rectify some of those things. But I think the card spoke an interesting truth of, in reality, the forgiveness only is required because we're creating the negative definition that creates the resentment or the hatred. And if you recognize they're actually of service to you by showing you what you don't prefer, there's actually nothing really to forgive because they've done you this favor. They've given you an example of a path that maybe you have no business going down. Right. 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 Yeah, that makes sense. I love that. There's a, there's a, um, a researcher that I, that I listen to sometimes um, that uh, was talking about Basically, um, he's really dialed in spirits. He's a Celtic guy, and I'm gonna, he's going to remain nameless for the time being because there's some kind of he's basically considered a conspiracy theorist, and so whatever. I'm not saying I believe all of his pitch, but one thing he mentioned was um, this idea of where we get inspiration from. Okay, and we all want guidance. We all want grace. We all want to, to be dialed in and kind of the intuitively know. Yeah, I should do this. I shouldn't do this. And, I think most people would agree that's a good sense to have. Um, you need to empty ourselves to hear it. Like basically he was saying, if you want to hear the voice of God or the voice of source, mm. it's not going to turn itself up, its volume. You have to turn your volume down. So people that go around like what's right is available, what's wrong is available. We could always, okay, you did this wrong, you did this right. That's all our choice. But that you're just getting stuck in your racket. It's not until we relax and let go, empty the mind. That's like my favorite card, my favorite hexagram in the I Ching is modesty. Okay? The creative works to empty what is full and offer abundance to what is modest. So you can see it with people that are, why do people just love it when somebody big and rich gets taken down? You know, it's this inherent thing. Like, you know, the bling, like you're, 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 like the real money, you don't know who they are because they're smart enough to not make themselves a target. Like you have all this stuff, you're by nature a target. So don't, even if you want to create whatever you want to create, that's fine, free will. But so much of that process is not actually about go and get more. It's actually about making room for the very thing you're calling for. Relax, let go. You'll open up to that guidance, to that grace, whatever it is you're looking for, that modesty. Yeah. Right? So yeah, so much of it is, is just that, 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 that openness, the heart mind openness. Wow. And that this is cool because this is this is segueing into a topic that I think for a lot of folks right now is really important, which is that idea of abundance. Because I think a lot of folks right now are going through issues with income essentially, because so many businesses had shut down and there's a lot of folks that are essentially like rebuilding their infrastructure. And I feel like the rat race is essentially that mentality you just said of, oh, I need to go out and get more, but on like the down to earth scale, right? Like the big high up super wealthy people, maybe they're still doing that, but that mentality has trickled down to like just about everybody in most realities of the United States, right? It's like, I need to go out, work for somebody, make a living, um, sacrifice, martyr myself essentially for this paper because yeah, yeah. if I don't get that paper, my family can't eat or I can't eat or what have you. And what it's really communicating to me is people are convinced that that's what they need to do or they will die. And I think it's this sort of this or that mentality. of If I don't work for somebody, if I don't get this job, if I don't do that, then all of my fears will come true and I will essentially die. But I think really people are missing sort of the middle path, which is – that, as, as I've heard you phrase it before, that feminine expression of attraction, right, which is to essentially magnetize that which you desire to you through your vibration. And I think what you're saying here of emptying yourself, 
right, of all of the judgments and the energies that are actually pushing that abundance away, once you're empty of all that and you put the good virtues in and you grow the virtues, then you become a magnet for those external treasures. But like not just any external treasure, the ones that are actually going to help you fulfill your destiny and yeah, will help yeah. that type of mentality be available for those whom you essentially pass your DNA on to, right, your children. Yeah. It's essentially like building like a sacred legacy is how I would understand it. Absolutely. Well, it's everything is born out of condition. So it's the idea of, you know, embody the earth, heaven will chase you, to use a da famous Taoist saying along the lines of what we're saying. So the masculine, when it wants something, it's assertive, it goes and gets it. The Tao means way, but its full definition is water course way. So it's a more, there's still plenty of masculine energy there. It's balanced, yin and yang. But most of the spiritual heaven-centric traditions, really, you can see it, man. They have, you know, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, nothing against Christianity. But, hey, how are you going to have a child without a woman? Like, come on. You know, so, so where's the feminine energy there, right? So um, the Tao embodies that more than any other spiritual tradition that I've seen. They have so much, you know, patriarchal stuff, you know, masculine stuff. And it's like, okay, fine, fire, fire, fire. But... Let's balance it with water. So um, it's creating the condition for what you want. And then, yes, like magnet, you attract it to you. Because even if you go and get it, it's the idea of like, fine, you found a treasure. But if you don't have the container, if you don't have the condition to hold it, you don't have it. It's like, I, 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 I found a treasure, but I have no way to carry it. So that's why people are just, I want it now, I want it now, I want it now. You know, it just, it just... That's not how nature works, you know. So, so yeah, this is this moment in time. There's a lot of forces behind it. But one of the big, th I see some benefits too, because people are having for the first time, like just sit still, be with yourself. Who are you? People are so. If you look around the world, people are so, you know, horse following the the, the, the carrot with this thing called money. There is nothing in mass worldwide that people spend more of their focus and therefore their energy on than this thing called money. And it's like when I listen to the, and that's not an accident, that is absolutely put there. So people just, you know, are just absolutely choking on that, that idea. And I don't have a problem with money, that's fine. But is that all? I mean, like I studied, my, my yoga teacher was a gerontologist, is a gerontologist, master gerontologist. And I've, and I've held space for people that were on their deathbed. And I've seen a lot of research of what people say on their deathbed they don't say I needed to make more money. The top 10 things people say on their deathbed. They say, say I needed to connect with my relatives. I needed to cultivate my, my, my relationship to whatever you call the spiritual reality, this idea of money, and that's fine. Go do that. Pay your taxes, you know, have fun. But what's the real reason we're here? I don't think that was all that whatever the creative force was, is go make money and that's all. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for God so loved the world, he gave them the dollar bill. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? right, exactly. So, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. yeah it's, so much of it is just like, I feel like this moment in time, we're getting to like reevaluate reality, you know, because this is, this is precipice. I mean, we may or may not get into this today. This is like a whole, this is the biggest change we've seen in known history. As far as I'm concerned, this is revelations where just things are being revealed, like how things really work, few people controlling the many, like, where do we want to go from here? And I think people like you and me that have some, some tools for, for, you could call it spiritual tools, you could just call it state management tools, however you want to frame that, I think we're going to be in very, very high demand, not personally you and me, like just people, the idea. People are so consumed by make money, make money, make money. I mean, my dad spends more time cleaning his car than he does taking care of himself. Nothing personal, Dad. I love you, but it's like, you know, I don't understand that. I don't understand how people like, you know, what about your first house? Anyway, that would yeah. be upset. No, I, I, under, I understand that too. I think we all have people we've, we've met or people we're close to. I know my parents too, where I'm like looking at so many of what they invest themselves in at like 100%, all right. of their focus. Then I'm like, what about all these other things? Hold on. It's, it, it, and it is that. I mean, it's, I think it has to do a lot with the way television works because I think a lot of people go into that alpha brainwave state essentially and they're just getting hit with all of these things that become priorities and I think 
really this goes back to getting getting back to nature because I think when we turn off the screens, turn off the social media, we're left with not just ourselves as the individual, but we're left with ourselves as the reality we're creating. So we get to understand more of who we are through just literally being here and being focused in the moment because then I get to talk to you, right? And just through talking to you in this moment, LJ, right? You're like another person in my reality and I'm learning so much about myself just through our conversation. I get to go out of this room, talk to my roommate. I learn more about myself. I get to talk to my neighbors. I'm learning more about myself through that contrast of self and other interacting. And I don't get that if I have a TV. I get artificial interactions and I get artificial examples of what it is to be human. That and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's it, to me it's missing it's missing the it's missing the point and it's living life on the sidelines. Definitely. And, yeah, and I think that for a lot of people that are like, I want to be something. I want to be someone, right? I want to achieve great things. I think every human has that desire in some way, shape, or form. Like, I want to. I want to be, right, like essentially the embodied God or goddess or both that I am, right? That's, I think, a part of every human. And I really think the answer is turning the screens and stuff off or at least just reducing them, right? So no more than like an hour a day and then letting your relationships with yourself and others be the real priorities because that's what we have. And as David Wolf said, the largest determiner of lifespan is relationships and community. He said more than food, more than exercise, more than sleep. He was like, it's community and relationships are the number one determiner of lifespan. Which makes sense to me because if the more relationships you have, the more well-known you are, the more immortalized you are in the collective consciousness. And- I, I agree. Go ahead. Yeah. That was that was the gist, yeah. Yeah, no, I just had another thought that ties into that. I absolutely agree, relationship, and to take it a step, farther it's actually with ourselves as well because most people this whole idea of self-discovery most people don't really know and i don't say this in a condescending way i mean it's the nature of nature there's more we don't know than we know mm-hmm. but it's just the nature of nature so it includes ourselves there's more i don't know about myself than i know mm-hmm. okay so that's everybody right but the thing is um these practices the Tao. I mean, even if you're not into all that, I mean, because I've, I've heard stories of people that like disappeared in the middle of the wilderness or whatever, or a shipwreck kind of thing. And then you hear about what they did to occupy their time. And it resembles very closely, quite often, what the Tao is and what these meditative Buddhist paths and so forth embody. Because whatever we focus on gets our energy. And so everything we do in a life, basically to the gesture, is about energy. It's about either getting more energy, food, inspiration on a formless level, or emotional upliftment, all of that's energy. And then also to discharge energy, to eliminate physically, to discharge emotionally, to let go of, of, of the stuff we don't need. So everything's about energy. And what is this unconscious desire that like, people have to be famous? Why does everybody want to be famous? I don't care how I get there. I just want to be famous. And then you have people like you know the Manson family or whatever, where it's like, he, Charles Manson was a very talented guitar player. He almost got picked up by whoever the Beach Boys producer was, but he didn't quite have have it. And then right after that is when all the BS started because he didn't care. I just want to be famous. It's like a little kid. If I can't get the parents' attention, I'm going to act up just to get that fame. Why? Because all the people focusing on me, I get the energy. He's, he's basically, in a sense, a demon immortal. Like he's immortalized himself. Everybody just in your mind, okay, Manson, that's kind of like a Hitler or something. You know, you just, oh, that's like what not to do. And he did immortalize himself. So the takeaway from that, amongst probably many, learn how to put your focus where you want it. Most people cannot. They sit down to just calm down. Their mind is everywhere. Learn how to put your attention on the sound of your breath. Learn how to put your attention on on your inner smile, radiant sun in your heart. Learn how to put your focus where you want it. And you'll put your energy where you want it. Most people can't do that. And that's why they love TV. Do it for me. But you don't realize you're putting your energy you know, all the advertisers and all the thought forms. It's like one of my favorite movies ever in the 70s, too. It's old. Network. Where they talk about, like, Howard Beale, you know? It's like, holy crap! You have the biggest companies in the world that control this little thing called the television that gives more people their reality than parents. You've got a big problem. 
It was like the movie Wag the Dog, you know? It's like, well, if it's on TV, it's real. You know, people don't even question where the hell is this coming from? They can't discern, like, is this real or not? Well, it came on TV, it must be real. And we see this right now a lot with all the crazy stuff going on in the mainstream media. So not to get conspiracy theory about everything, just simply learn how to manage your focus and you will learn how to put your energy where you want it. And this, this brings me to my, my next question for you, LJ, too, is with these practices, and I know you've, you've experimented and you have uh, adventured into so many different realms of spiritual technology, be it yoga, be it the Buddhist Dharma meditations, be it the, the Tao meditations. Do you have maybe like one, two, one or two meditations that you feel each human being should become aware of for their own evolution and their own development of their their spirit? Yes, that's a great question. Probably the most famous meditation is just listening to the sound of the breath. You just keep your attention on the sound of the breath from the beginning to the middle to the end of the sound of the breath and the space in between. Because by doing that, you're probably gonna deepen the breath because the easiest way I know of to recover from trauma, physical, emotional, and otherwise, is to enter a parasympathetic state. And the easiest way to do that is to lengthen the exhalation. So most people know, oh, I'm stressed out, do deep breathing. You know, like Lamaze, right? You're going through childbirth, do deep breathing, right? But it's not just deep breathing. It's the exhalation, focusing on the long exhalation is what's gonna slow the heart rate down the fastest. You're gonna enter a parasympathetic state the fastest, and you're gonna relax and recover the fastest from whatever trauma is guaranteed in the human experience that, that you're having. It's, it's just so simple. You want to relax and digest that. So I really, really like the six healing sounds by the Universal Healing Dao. And it's not exclusive to UHT. It's, it's one of the most famous in all of the Dao, where you just take a big deep breath in each organ and you make the exhale as long as you can. Because most of our detoxification actually happens through the lungs, up to 80%. I know there's varying numbers I've seen from different research, but, but the majority of our detox is just happening through the lungs. So by lengthening that exhalation, you're maximizing physical detoxification, and then you're also maximizing the emotional detox because you're entering that parasympathetic state by slowing the heart rate. So, so pure and simple, and I know there's a reason you ask you know, so many masters breathing. There's more written about breathing in yoga than all other subjects combined for a reason. Lengthen that exhale, and you'll enter that parasympathetic state, and you, you can start to be present with the choices you make, you can start responding instead of reacting, freaking out. Most people are so in their reptilian brain right now with fear and anger and all this stuff, they don't truly don't know what they're doing. They're, they're, there's some other hidden hand they're actually not so hidden nowadays. It's you know, puppet mastering this thing. Calm down, lengthen your exhale. So just to answer you succinctly the six healing sounds, but even simpler, just listen to the sound of your breath, and lengthen the exhale, five, six, seven deep breaths. I mean, we're not talking about a big thing. Go longer if you want, but just that, that little shield of that lengthening the exhalation goes a long, long way in our emotional and overall state. I'm, I'm applying it now, <laughs> and it's super, <laughs> honestly, I'm like listening to you, I'm just like lengthening my exhale. I'm like, this is, because it's so, it's crazy. I feel like humans love complexity for some reason. And right. I, for me included, I'm like, oh, just breathe. I'm like, duh, you know, but then it's like, but am I like really breathing, right? Am I really breathing at 100%? And that's where it becomes really mind blowing because when you take the advice, right? When I take the advice that you just provided for everybody here and I apply it, I know for me, natural euphoria just is, is there. And I think it's because that's the true foundation our natural bliss, our natural pleasure. I think that's the true foundation of our being. And then it's like the mind stories, right? Whether they be positive or negative, sort of are like clouds that sort of obfuscate that true foundation. And like a positive thought will feel good. A negative thought will feel good, but that's still just the mental, or not, excuse me, negative thought might not feel so good. But those are just the mental realms of the being. When we use the breath to sedate that mental realm, then the true bliss the true pleasure is really just there in us. And that's extremely exciting. And I, um, it was fun to just like listen to you from that place because it was like just, just super bubbly.
Well, it's like, thank you. And it's like what we were talking earlier, like how can I empty myself? Whatever you want to create in your life, won't you do it better if you're relaxed, if you have an open container? It's like, I want to fill my cup with whatever the immortal nectar is. And I find there's the fountain of the immortal nectar. My cup's already full. There's no room. So, so many people think I got to go get more, 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 more. We are choking on more right now. We are choking on unsustainability right now. Totally choking. You know, so yeah, there's a lot of fancy practices we can share, but like there's a reason that simplicity through time is, you know, it works because it's simple. It's got to be quick and easy. It's like my, the first martial art I went really deep into was Aikido. And there's a famous book called The Secrets of Aikido by O Sensei Mori Yoshiba. And he, he, they outlined that book like, okay, students, they asked him, will you tell us the secrets of Aikido? Sure, meet me here at sunrise tomorrow. And they all show up, and, you know, and they're waiting for the master to get there. And they think he's going to show them some fancy throw or whatever pin or whatever. It was all linguistic. It was how to chant, 100%, not one martial art technique. And then he just picks up and walks away. And everybody's left scratching their head. But it's like that inner space of your practice. And, and you know, and, and so I, it's, it's, yeah, bottom line. I mean, you know, that's kind of going in the direction of linguistics now. But still, it's just quite often the answers to whatever we're seeking are not what we think it is. It's usually a simpler, more fundamental calm down, settle. It's like what you just said. It's like as soon as I just took those few deep breaths, boom, I'm, I'm feeling good right now. Whoa. It's just like so simple. So quite often it's like this, yeah, this simple approach, at least to start with. We can get more advanced if you want, but that'd be my response, you know, yeah. simple response. Because if you don't have simplicity, complexity will likely just be chaos. It That's will likely right. not be sustainable. Because we see that now, right? We have complexity in our civilization, but without a strong development of the simplistic mechanisms of nature and it leads to chaos but when we bring everything back to square one and we refine and we infinitely master right the first step right by just always developing that new relationship with it that new understanding of it through living it then we can naturally take those bigger steps to the complexities it's like you know not racing to the finish line taking your time enjoying the view getting to know the route on the way to that finish line oh definitely I love that you keep, you know, that word relationship. I mean, I did an interview a while ago with one of my buddies who does a podcast about money, really pretty well-known CPA in LA. And like, okay, so at the end of the interview, childhood, you know, experiences, what's the coolest thing you've seen, you know, in this lifetime for me, it was seeing the dragon. I can tell you about that story if you want. Um, but it was, you know, what are you, what's your legacy basically? If you could just impart one thing that you've learned for the benefit of humanity, what would it be? It'd be the work I've done around relationships because it, yes, actual two people together relate and all, all when all that means emotionally, physically, sexually, all of that, that realm, but even just in your own self, quite often we look for things outside of ourselves that like, if you just dial in all of the elements that exist outside of you exist within you as above, so below. So it's like, you were talking about the thoughts, one kind of more, um, advanced, I guess, it's not really advanced, one other detail of, of breathing, kind of step further, okay, listen to the sound of your breath, well, then the next level of that would be, you're sitting before a stream, and that's your breath, and thoughts are like leaves passing in the stream, so I notice a positive thought, I notice a negative thought, either way, positive or negative doesn't matter, we just want the chi, which means we need to put our focus where we want it, so it's just like a leaf passing in a stream, I see a leaf passing in the stream, but I bring my attention back to the stream of my breath, the coolness of my nostrils, lengthening that exhale, you know? So yeah, it's so much of it is just this, this letting go, return to the breath, return to the center, bring my focus here. And now I have energy to be creative, respond, create the world I want to live in. Most people are absolutely stuck on fight or flight. They do not know how to relax and they, you know, numb it with all their whatever drugs and alcohols. Okay, you know, no judgment, zero, absolutely done but it's like why are you doing that oh to overcome suffering you might want to try this first instead of creating more suffering with that yeah it's it's true and it's it's that quick easy fix i think that really people are gravitating to and the undervaluing of their own inner power right because all these techniques all they're designed to do is to activate the spiritual potential within oneself yes. so i think if someone's devaluing who they are as a being with their self-judgments and limiting 
constructs of what a human being is, then I think they will seem to naturally gravitate outside of themselves because the power couldn't be in here. In here is a piece of crap. In here is worthless. And I think that's what people get stuck in. So they're inclined to believe the sources outside of themselves because they've been taught to disregard that which is essentially immortal, right? That which is yeah, within yeah. themselves, you know? Yeah. yeah. When has it ever not been now? The immortal now, mm -hmm. you know? And people want so badly to be seen. I mean, again, where's this unconscious desire to be famous? Why is it such a big thing? Because they want the energy. Okay, but well, can you pay attention to yourself? Why is there such a track record of famous people to absolutely fall off the deep end with substances and so forth? It's like that, that, that's a hard, that's a knife's edge to walk. And it's just like the only people I've seen that even come close to doing fame in, in a way that I would say, okay, he or she ha has it is the ones that have some sort of a, of a, of a you call it a spiritual practice or just a, you call it a self-reflection practice, whatever, how do you frame that? Some way to relate with your own inner nature. Because the more you develop that, the more you can understand the, the overflow, the extension of that, which is the external world. It's all one. You want to know what's going on out, out here? Figure out what's going on in here, inside. And these practices are designed to help us to tune into that and, you know, that's one of the benefits I'm seeing right now with uh, kind of the stay-at-home thing is people have time to, you know, to do practice. I'm getting more people interested in practice now, you know, because they have time for it. They're not just choking on this rat race of money. Right. I, I want to I spend um, one more moment on what you said about your one of your passions, which is assisting people in relationships. I want to just hear a little bit of how you enjoy doing that and sort of the, the things that you offer that are – based in this idea of healing relationships. That's a great, great topic because it's one of the biggest wounds I see in humanity is sexual wounding, is relationship wounding. So even fine, you're not a full blown and abusive physical getting beat up, but there's all kinds of emotional abuse in relationships. Um, so it's kind of the idea of like, you want to be with your partner, but I don't just want to be with my partner. Like we make a date, okay, you know, mommy and daddy or any, any relationship of two people. I don't just want to be with that person. I don't want quality attention. So somebody's on their phone, they're not present. That's not quality time. Why? Because you're not focusing on that person. Quality attention means focus on that person. So even just in the name of everything we've talked about here regarding put your change your focus, change your state, put your focus and therefore your energy where you want it by learning how to put your focus on yourself. So much healing comes out of listening. So we do the inner smile, all of our organs, our inner body God where our emotions are, are literally being produced biochemically in the endocrine glands. Okay, I tune in what's going on with you, and then I'm able to release some of that tension. It's the same way you start listening to somebody, hey, what's going on with you? And they just start break down and crying, you know, because they needed that release, and they needed just that little energetic push. So learning how to focus on yourself, you're going you're gonna to hone the muscle of your focus. Therefore, you can give your partner's partner more quality attention. That's what they want, and then real magic can happen. So distracted nowadays. We literally have a shorter attention span than goldfish now, humans. Literally. Not not a joke. Like literally shorter than a goldfish. Pathetic. You know, in my humble opinion, pathetic. And we can do something about that. So 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 everything we've talked about certainly plays a role. Have some way to manage your state on your own. Because if you don't, you're gonna carry it into your relationships. There's a very this might really interest you in our listeners. It was it was such a lights off experience. Like just absolute whoa revelations uh, ex experience for me when I learned this. So in traditional yoga, there's prana and apana. So prana, chi, um, is the upwards expanse of energy. In, in specifically the term prana, it's the upward expanse of moving energy. And apana is the eliminative energy. So whoever you're having sex with, okay, you're connecting your eliminative organs to them. Okay, because why is it that we want to tell above all? It doesn't matter if I've told 10 people how bad of a day I've had. I don't feel like I've, I've discharged, let that go until I can tell, where's my partner? I've got to tell my partner that, right? Mm -hmm. Because whoever you're aligning your eliminative organs to, that is where our eliminative native energy wants to go on an emotional level. When I reprogram my understanding of this, I stop being um, a jerk when my partner wanted to vent on me emotionally. Now I don't even perceive that language. You're not venting on me. You're just saying what you need to say to get it off your chest. That is a sacred relationship for me to 
to sit here and listen to you basically complain, basically hold space for your partner to complain, okay? But now it's incumbent upon us in knowing what I just said to be polite about it. It's the idea of like, I invite you into my house and pardon the descriptive, but you're gonna go and you're gonna make in the bathroom. Okay, there's a way to do that politely where I'm gonna, you know, be neat about it. I'm not gonna trash your bathroom. I'm certainly not gonna come out of the bathroom and dump my excrement on your head like Socrates' wife was famous for doing, okay? Um, I'm gonna, you know, so in a similar way, I'm going to ideally, first and foremost, d discharge the negative emotions around my negative emotions that I have within myself, relax and let go, and then, okay, yeah, a little extra whim of that, whatever's going on, I can't process, okay, honey, yeah, I have a little bit of a bad day because of this or whatever, but I'm not going to say, you know, I'm not going to weaponize it. Most people weaponize their negative emotions, especially in relationships, and this is why psychotherapists have one of the biggest suicide rates of any group, because people are just like, eh, they have no way to just manage your own state. So just in the name of relationships, we're not talking highfalutin, enlightenment, immortality. That's, we'll save that for the next interview. We're just talking about just to be a skillful human and skillful in relationships, manage your own emotional state. That's one thing. Um, and then to take it a step further, the, the work that I've done with body work, where I went to Thailand and I learned Thai massage, which is considered the king of massage, because it, it basically integrates all known styles. You've got stretching is the yoga, you've got the acupressure, you can integrate the oil if you want, it's all there. And then what I integrated with that was the relationship reflexology from the Taoist sexual kung fu and the traditional tantra from India, the relationship reflexology with, I used to call it tantric Thai, but I, I, don't, I don't do that anymore because tantra is totally misunderstood and the Thai people hate the association of anything sens sensual because they're pretty conservative over, over there with respect. So now I just call it Tao Intimate Massage because the Tao, the Tao, it's like the water, you know, it goes to the bottom, it'll, it'll go anywhere, it doesn't care, there's, there's room for anything in the Tao. But I just call it Tao Intimate Massage. It's basically learning how to touch your partner because most people have no idea how to skillfully touch somebody, none at all. They just go and they just, you know, do that. And there's a reason why most relationships fail. There's a reason why most people are absolutely sexually unfulfilled. Learn how to skillfully touch each other. So I think... A little bit of healing touch in that way goes a long way. Your own practice goes a long way. And then, of course, the sexual cultivation practices, especially for men, although humans, I think, period, but women are already sexually superior to men. So it's, it's kind of considered optional for them in, in the Tao anyway. I still think everyone would do well to learn it just to maximize that and deal with all the appertaining emotions and everything around it. But you know, women are already sexually superior to men. They would have to be to go to childbirth and all that. One of the main reasons, according to the Tao, women outlive men because they have more sexual, um, you know, vitality. So in particular for men, learning just some basics of like learning how to last at least 20 minutes in the experience. I mean, that alone would, could change the game, change the game, you know? So yeah, sexual kung fu, skillful touch. And again, your own practice, just have some way to deal with the heart of the human experience which is the emotional experience. Excellent. That, that's, that's great. I think a lot of people will benefit tremendously from listening to this because I think relationship issues, I know for myself included, right? That's been such a big thing. Like whether it's relationships with partner, whether it's relationship with family, it's like relationships with the self. Relationships in general really are where the rubber meets the road because we can study all this advanced stuff, all these great philosophical ideas and metaphysical understandings. But if our relationship with ourselves and other is garbage, then those concepts and understandings are essentially worthless. So yeah, it's like yeah. taking these things and then applying them through the practice gives them life through one's actions. And in my opinion, that's how one creates heaven on earth. And I think oh, yeah. that that's that's beautiful that you're touching on all of this because it's, it's very important. And if LJ, if people want to find you, if people want to get sessions with you for relationship stuff, energy cultivation, where can people best find you and contact you? Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, you mentioned my two wellness.org. So the number two, the word wellness.org just takes you right to YouTube. There's a ton of free videos. My most popular one was the Thai partner massage for lovers that's one but it's all free if you want my more because i did that stuff long long time ago i've really worked and updated all that stuff so loverskill.com is, is is one of my 
my main site that I have a ton of massage videos on there. A lot of them are free. Of course, there's a subscription. You can get my whole series of them. So you could reach out to me, Lover Skill. My email is intimatedow at gmail. Um, so you could always just email me direct. Um, yeah, and then also, I mean, rawtantra.com is where I go deep just for men. But that's like the most like X-rated, so to speak. It's like, all right, men, here we go. It's like, just here's how to be a man. Boom. It's like full on, you know, whereas lover skill is a little bit softer, just body work focused. Um, so yeah, in, intimate Dow at Gmail. You can ask me questions. I put out so much free content. I mean, there's plenty there, especially now with, you know, people like where are we going to get the paycheck and so forth. I just want, I just want people to know this. Mm, that's, that was one of the things that drew me to you as a teacher, I might add hundred percent like the fact you were so generous with all the material like that's where i was like i like i felt compelled to like learn from you and to like just develop some kind of relationship with you because i feel what you're doing is really the core principle of abundance right like it's like if what's the phrase like if you if you love it i'm probably gonna get this phrase butchered essentially but it's along the lines of just like if you love what you're doing right like give it give a little bit of it away is more or less the gist right like don't just hoard the treasure, like share the treasure so people know about it, right? And if yeah. people watch one of your videos and they apply something and they get benefit, right? That like is a breadcrumb. They're like, whoa, there's probably more where that just came from. And I think for people in business, what you're employing as a strategy is one of the best strategies out there, which is give a little bit of it away so people know what you're about. There's no loss, right? Because you are the content. Right, you can make more videos, right? It's not like you're like creating a deficiency in yourself, right? You're just doing what you love, capturing it, and then giving a gift, you know. So that in of itself will magnetize equal abundance right back. So I, I think oh, for it's sure, for yeah. sure, that's my gift for me is like seeing people applying this. You know, one thing I, I want to say too, because we were discussing like what we were going to talk about today. This is one of the reasons that attracted me to the Tao, because even in the Tantra world, which was my original awakening, and I'm talking like. Kundalini Tantra, like right hand of the right hand, like all white, and wearing all white and so forth. I almost became a Sikh, but I didn't want to. Um, they have right hand path, left hand path. They don't really touch sexual energy to the level that I wanted to master it. So the Tao, it doesn't have that reservation. It's like, boom, here it is. So the Tao really has a lot to offer in the way of relationships. So that's why a lot of my media gets into partner practices that way. Um, but, but one thing I also want to mention, so that aside, the Tao, okay. Um, but one thing I do want to mention is um, our relationships are so, um, so much of it is proportional to the quality of our communication. And so that's one thing that um, I, I, I researched a lot. And, and I just want to mention this. I call it core four communication commitments. And I didn't invent these. There's a really famous couple. They were on, I saw on TED Talks. And I don't like a lot of the stuff I see on TED Talks. I just want that to be clear. But they do a lot of globalist crap that I'm not on board with. But some stuff they have, they have, they're, they're into, that, that I'm into, that I like. And they had these two, this is couple. One of them was a, they're both from London. One of them was a cop, uh, one of them was a professor. And the other one was some other academic bigwig. And they almost broke up because they were always fighting. And so they came up with these core four, I call it core four communication commitments. And they're so simple and elegant that I think it might serve you and your listeners. First one is be curious, not critical. Okay. The second one is be careful, not crushing. The third one is ask, don't assume. And the fourth one is connect before you correct. Now, we get a lot of these intuitively. It's like when somebody says, well, I really love you. And they're like, wait, for what? You know what I mean? But let me just focus for a moment on the first one, okay? Be curious, not critical. Even when we have license to be critical, because if you're in a relationship with somebody, that's one of the biggest reasons I see relationships fail. We get tired of our partner's humanness, and we run off to another relationship only to realize they're humans too, okay? Poop stinks. Sorry. So it's like... Even when I have license to be critical, you did something to legitimately, you were trying to hurt my feelings level of I have license to be critical. I still rather than you were trying to hurt me and I'm going to criticize you. I'm still, I'm just curious why you felt you needed to do that. There is such a universe of a shift there in the spirit of criticism versus the spirit of curiosity because your partner can smell it. 
you're walking around critical. Most people, it's like one of Tony Robbins' things that he said that really enrolled me to want to train with him was, if you do what you did at the end of a relationship, if you do what you did at the beginning of the relationship, at the end of the relationship, there wouldn't be an end. Because in the beginning, it's all about what can I give versus in the end, it's all about what am I get? What am I get? What am I getting? Right? Mm -hmm. And so we walk around, it's impossible to not have something happen if you spend enough time with the same person that's going to annoy you. And it might even be some of you a legitimate reason to be critical. You did something intentionally to hurt my feelings. You tried to, that kind of thing. Even when it's trying to be personal, it's not personal. Like the four agreements, nothing is personal. So that spirit of curiosity versus criticism, careful, not crushing, ask, don't assume, connect before you correct, they, they really, really serve. Have, have served me. I'm not, you know, shitting on anybody, but I thought that might be uh, of service to you to know that. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's, it's awesome advice, man. I can pinpoint in my own history, like data bank, as I'm like scanning in my own past. I'm like, oh, I can like see where I didn't apply those things and where relationships with people did go south because I was being a jerk, right? Because being no one wants to be around someone who's critical. That's like be, be painful at times, depending on how intense that person is. And but curious, I mean, curious is, in, in my opinion, curious teeters into like, that flirtatious magnetism, right? Like more right, curious right. about a lover. It's like, oh, I want to explore. I want to get to know you. And that's totally inviting where the critical thing, that's like this repulsive kind of dynamic. So I, yeah. It takes a lifetime, a lifetime to build a relationship. And in a single word, it can be destroyed. A single word, that's it, done. So you put that S in front of the word, you have a sword. So, I mean, it's like, that's where magic comes from. You know, you charge up some cosmic process and then you say, uh, presto, which by the way, is a very powerful word. Um, and then it happens automatically. So you charge up, imagine like a lifetime of emotions and charge up from whatever you're critical of your partner. And you say, yeah, that's all that emotional energy is in that word. And it's it, it pops the bubble of your relationship. And, and once, I mean, it's like, you know, somebody legally dies, maybe you can resuscitate them. But once they've been dead for a while, it's already so grounded. That's it, there comes a point where relationship cannot be resuscitated mm -hmm. and my, well I, I still am a perpetual optimist i still believe that if you really i mean I, I i don't give up me personally but i just see most people once it, it gets that bad it's over so an ounce of prevention is worth a ton of cure so these these core four communication commitments really help me you know in communicating and so does all the self the self state management techniques we've been talking about if i have something that i'm noticing that i that i want to like Bent on my partner, I want to sit with that first. Even if it's just a few deep breaths, I need to like be really clear because that one word spoken in anger, man, even just medically speaking, five minutes of anger equals hours of depressed immune system function. Hours. And in all of time and space, anger is the most destructive human emotion. But especially now, this moment demands our sincerity. We have so many challenges coming up from all angles. We need as much of a way to bind together, to unify. There's a reason why divide and conquer with all these different factions of men and women separate and all the races know and we all hate each other and, and the classes and all this, you know, this is on purpose, you know? Figure out a way to relate to yourself, relate to others. We're so much stronger, unified, unified with ourselves, unified with our partners, mm -hmm. unified in our community. That's the biggest danger to, 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 to the, uh, de-evolutionary forces pulling some of the strings right now. Wow. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. I mean, that really is it, the unification. And that's where the practices, I think, come in, because that's where you're, especially fusion, right? Fusion, the, yeah. the, the UHT system, right? You're fusing in the lower Dantian and the cauldron all of the different elements. You're bringing all of these seemingly contradictory and opposing elements together in balance, and yeah. that begins to form this immortal process in my opinion right that's where oh, all of the sure. bigger things and that's yes <laughs> it brings me back to what we were talking about before the interview right about just this idea of of fusion and of these practices especially when we're dealing with people in public i think that that's um yeah it's amazing all the parallels between the inner world and the outer world well even even the word yoga means union but yeah like i mean back to the uht for a moment like when we study the advanced formulas we have we always start with the inner smile and then there's other practices, six links, sound with the orbit. But like basically at any level 
of practice, we're doing the smile and fusion and con and leave. So what's the essence of the inner smile emotionally is acceptance and appreciation. So it's like you have a party, you come in, hey, welcome, I accept you. I'm really grateful for you're here. That's the appreciation, great. Now everybody's here, now we're having fusion. We're collecting all the information. What happened to you? What happened to you? Oh, you've been traveling, great. Bring it all in, okay. Now everything's in the cauldron. And then what's the con and leave? We put the fire under the cauldron and now you have the transformation. Basically, those three things happening all the time, you know, that, that, you know, so, I mean, th this is the time, dude, where it's like, the mo this is the most unprecedented situation in the history of humanity. I mean, aliens are probably going to land, all kinds of stuff happening. And to have a practice, back to my overarching theme of this whole conversation, it begins and ends there. It's like, even the moment of death, you know, we were talking before this conversation, you know, it's like, people, the biggest problem with death is fear. This fear makes energy scatter at extreme shock levels, just scatter. It'd be like going to sleep terrified. You're not going to sleep very well. Fusion is one of the master formulas for, for what we call death practice. Because I want to be unified within myself, within my relationship, within the community, within the universe to, you know, just flat out ultimate reality, you know. And so to have some of these practices, yeah, there's a lot of people you kind of come to your own thing. But why reinvent the wheel? These are like tens of thousands of years from what it looks like certainly we know thousands but i think this is way older than we've been told yeah i'm, you know, I'm why do you invent the wheel they're all there for us mm -hmm. exactly exactly lj well i i know i want to respect your time lj i know we've gone a little bit over and um this has been truly an amazing conversation this is a conversation i wanted to have with you uh since i started getting to know you so i'm really thankful we're getting to have it now in this amazing Thank context you. Yeah, it's a blessing, man. Thank you for all the great work you're doing. It's really an honor just to connect with you, overflowing to all that are listening. And uh, and I really just for a moment want to thank you personally because, dude, it's really people that are interested. Because I was a gap model for years and I worked in Hollywood and all this. But like how to be magnetic. People that are interested are interesting. And your passion for what you do is magnetic it makes people like what are you talking about so i'm so grateful for you and the work you're doing and all the that we just need it more than ever now so thank you for being such a bright light sir you got it man you got it my eternal unconditional love and appreciation to you lj and thank you for uh, spending this hour with me my friend yeah likewise blessings always